Hallelujah. Am I on? You're on. Oh, hallelujah. Let me get that other light on. We can see you even better. Oh, yes. I am handsome. I need more light. Or else, <laughs> else you'll see my shadow. I bring you greetings all the way from Uganda, Africa. I bring you greetings from your friend, Pastor Michael Chaze. He sent me, he released me, he knows I'm here, and he told me to send you his love. And if you pray for him, he will be back sometime. I bring you greetings from his wife, Mama Christine. When we came 2008, we were here, the three of us, and we loved being here. I want to thank God for uh, Pastor Jim and Mama Carol uh, for taking very good care of me. Every time I've been here, to, I came last, I came yesterday, and I think I've put on a few pounds. They, they've cared very well for me. They've loved me, and I want to thank God for them. I also received the prophetic. Is that me? Unless Jesus is calling you, please t turn off your phone. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I, say, I was saying that uh, this morning I want to thank God for Pastor Jim and his wife, the love they have, the ministry they have. I respect them highly. Uh, Pastor Jim came to Uganda many years ago, and we are still praying that the Lord will bring him back. Uh, we know he will come sometime with Mama and be a blessing to us. It's nice to be here. I also bring you greetings from um, Tender Mercies International, the children you take care of. Uh, some of you send prayers, some of you send your heart, some of you send finances, uh, some of you send many other things. We want to thank you for supporting the little ones. Some of the children you've taken care of over the years have grown into young men and young women who have turned out to be very responsible, very godly, and they are a pride to us. Thank you for standing with us and serving the Lord. You are making a tremendous difference with the love, the finances, the prayers you send back to Uganda. Amen. I also bring you greetings from Blanche, the most beautiful girl on planet Earth. We've been married for 20 uh, 16 years, but uh, it took me five years to get her, to prove to her that I'm a good guy, that I will not disappoint her, and so I've known her for 21 years, and the Lord has blessed us with four children, Matthew is 15 years, Hannah is 13, her data is 10, and Moshe is 8, two boys and two girls, perfect family planning. God is my friend. I have the recipe. In case you need to balance, please come. Well, this morning, I do not know exactly what I'm going to speak about, but I'll let the Spirit of the Lord move me. I come from Africa. I come from Uganda, where we basically have nothing but Jesus. So I bring Jesus to you this morning. Some of you have too many things. Uh, in the houses where I have stayed, I have seen you have too many assistants. You have a washing machine, we don't. You have a dishwasher, we don't. You have cloth washer, cloth dryer, we don't. You have, you know, you have too many assistants. And life here is a little bit uh, easy for you because the many assistants you have. And probably you have too many other things you, you could hold on, hang on to. And they could, in a way, replace the Lord. I want to invite you this morning. To kind of release the things you could be holding on to, uh huh, and they are preventing you to hold on to the Lord. Let's put those aside this morning and let's touch the Lord. I want to believe with you for a, a, the wind of the Spirit, which um, Pastor Jim talked about. That the Spirit of the Lord will this morning just come and pass by us. You know, give us refreshment, touch us. You know, feel us again for some of us whose tanks are empty or halfway. So the Spirit of the Lord will fill us again so you don't drive with your meter in red. Huh? I don't know if you drive cars like that. Back home we have people whose cars never leave the red. 
you know. Each time they say, where am I going? I'm going to such and such a place. It is um, how many? 50, 20K. Okay, I need this amount of fuel. So they put in exact and they go by exact and come back by exact. And when they park their car, they will warn you, don't touch it. Because if you touch it and you don't go to the gas station, you will get stuck. You know, they have, they know how to balance their car. And sometimes in our spiritual life, you know how to balance it. You say, I just need a little bit of the Holy Spirit to take me through the week. And I just need a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Let's not balance. Let's accept the whole thing. Let the Lord move us, feel us, and touch us. And then we may have more than enough. For he promised that a river of life will flow out of us. So let's accept the river and not go by scoops and little, you know, little measures. Okay? Father, this morning, your children prepared. They prepared clothes. They prepared many things physically to be here. But Father, we also prepare in the Spirit. We ask that you may meet us here. Father, for the mountains and for the issues that we have, for the missions and the ministry we have to do, may your Spirit meet us today. May your Spirit meet us today. Holy Spirit, we give you this room. Fill it up, even as the Word is preached. Even in the ministry of the word, Spirit of the Lord, may you do your work in the lives of your children. We believe for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Are you ready for the word? Okay. I'm a marketplace pastor. And what simply that means is I pastor people as they do their work. And so I pastor their monies, I pastor their work, pastor their desks, their laptops, and things around work. And so I want to share a little bit about that introductory. I want to do an introductory message on a little bit of that so that next time um, Pastor Jim can invite me, okay? So I'm going to do a little bit of that and then we will see where the Spirit of the Lord will be. I want to minister under the subject, the spiritual aspect of your work. And we will begin reading scripture from Exodus chapter 20 and verse 9. Exodus 20 verse 9. Exodus 20 verse 9, the scripture says, Six days you will work, and on the seventh you will have rest. Scripture tells us, that we need to work six days. Where I come from, people want to work one day and rest six days. I don't know how it is here. Where I come from, people want to work one day and rest for six days. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. But scripture says we work six and rest one. Yeah, that's what the Lord says. Now, the way you relate to work determines what you will get from work. The way you relate with your workplace You could be working in a more formal place. You could be working in a place that is not very formal. But work is work, whatever it is. It could be very high level. It could be low level. But work is work. And back home, we know that money is money. It doesn't matter whether you get the money from White House or you get it from the, you know, wherever you earn the money from. When you go to the store to buy anything, money is money. It doesn't change. Amen. And so six days, the Lord says, you will labor. And on the sixth, you will relax. Now, I'm not saying go and work six days. But all I'm saying is that work is sacred. Work is divine. Work is of God. And work is a blessing. So tell your neighbor for me, it's a blessing to work. That's our Christian perspective. It's a blessing to work. Work is a blessing. Many people think work is a curse. And because of that... The way they relate with their work determines what they get. For us as Christians, work is a blessing. Back home, many people get heart attacks on Monday morning or Saturday, Sunday evening. And the reason why they get heart attacks on that particular, those particular days is because they dread Monday because work is going to begin. And they love Friday evening because, yay, tomorrow we are not working, we're going to sleep. 
and we are going to do this and watch a movie and drive around. Yeah, Saturday and Sunday. Woo. Then when it comes to Sunday evening, oh, again? And so they have heart attacks. And we call it a TGIF, you know, uh, TGIF uh, syndrome. You know, thank God it's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> and so as Christians, we should not have heart attacks on Sunday evening, neither should we have it on Monday morning. Because work is a blessing. Hallelujah. Amen. Work is good. Work is ordained of the Lord. It's a blessing. And that's my attitude. I go to work happy because I know God wants me to work. Yeah, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I also want to tell you that when you go to work, God is interested in your work. God loves your work. He's interested in it. And God wants to work with you as you work. As you labor, as you go about your business. God wants to work with you. We'll read a few scriptures. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Now, if you've been saved for more than eight years and you've never read Deuteronomy 28, I am praying for you. And the prayer is simple. Lord, give my brother and my sister love for their Bible. Thank you for saying amen. <laughs> if you've never read Deuteronomy 28, your prayer is there. More love for your Bible. Everybody who has been saved for more than seven years should have read Deuteronomy 28 and should have loved it. We will just read a few scriptures in there. We'll read verse 11. Deuteronomy 28, 11, it says, And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your ground, in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give unto you. Twelve says, and the Lord will open to you his good treasure. Hey, and the heavens to give you rain to your land in its season. And to bless all the work of your hand. Wow. And you shall lend to nations, but you shall not borrow. The Lord wants to be a part of your work. The Lord wants to bless your work. The Lord wants to see your work increase, multiply, blossom. Amen. The Lord wants you as a Christian not only to enjoy your work, but he wants to enjoy it with you to bless you so you could be a blessing. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I will read you another verse. Job 1.10. Job 1.10. Where are you, Job? Yes. Are you there? Have you not made a hedge around him? This was Satan complaining to God about Job's life. And he says, Lord, you have made a hedge around him, around his household, around all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. You see how God is interested in your work? He wants to put a hedge around you for protection while you have insurance too. But he wants to put a hedge of protection around you, around your house, around your work. And he wants to bless you. Hey, tell your neighbor, my work is blessed. Say it by faith. My work is blessed. God wants to be a part of your work and he wants to bless you while you work. Amen. That whatsoever you touch increases, blossoms, multiplies, that you may be a blessing to many, that you may have more than enough even for the kingdom. Praise the Lord. The devil's mathematics is minus and division. God's mathematics is multiplication and addition. And so when you're working, you need to look at the mathematics. If the mathematics is division and minus, mm, you should take caution. But if the mathematics is increase, multiplication and addition, yes, God is with me. Because that's what he promises. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. What is stealing? Removing from you value. What is killing? Removing from you life. What is destroying? Completely destroying. I don't know how to define that. But destroying is destroying. So that's the devil's mission. Anytime you see in your work, in your home, signs of things reducing 
and you can't explain why they are, you know, things going away, then that's a place for you to go and, oh, you know, red signs, eh? Alarm signals should go off. Something is going on which is not right. In case you buy fine china cup, you know, just to make this as an example, you buy fine china cups and the cups begin to lose handles. Do, does that happen here? Yeah. Back home, there are homes you visit. And this person bought fine china cups, six of them. But three do not have handles. Oh, oh. if you have something of value and for some unexplainable reason, the devil is touching it. Yeah? Things are happening to it. Those things are affecting your heart. Because what you value, if what you value is lost or destroyed, that directly touches your heart. Makes you uncomfortable. Makes you restless. And so God wants to bless you. That you may have enough. That you may be protected. That your things may be preserved. That you may have joy in the Lord. And if you see anything contrary, you need to arise. Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. That whole, that whole chapter has three parables. Number one, it has a parable of the man who had a hundred sheep. And he lost one sheep. And he said, no. He left the 99, went to look for the one sheep. I would stay with the 99 and say, okay, it's just one. Hallelujah. I have. He said, I will go and look for the one. And he went out, looked for the one, and he got back. When he brought it back, he called his friends. And they had a party. Whoa, there was music. Glory to God. I had lost one sheep. I looked for it. I found it. I brought it back. Hallelujah. Luke 15 has another lady. This lady had 10 buttons. Other Bibles say buttons. Other Bibles say small coins. We don't know the value of them. But one of them got lost. The Bible says she lit a lantern, swept her entire house until she found the one. Even while she had the nine, she did not say, okay, I will not bother with the one. She looked for the one, switched on the lights, Bible says lantern, and swept the house. We do not know how big the house is. We do not know how old she was. But you know, she went through it looking for the one. Praise the Lord. Bible says when she found the one, she called her friends and they came and there was party. Hallelujah. Probably she spent more on the party than the one she had lost. <laughs> but there was party. Hallelujah. And then Luke 15 also has a man who had two sons, the prodigal story. And one son went, prodigal, and the guy longed for the return of the son. And when the son came back after many days, the Bible says this man called for a party. He invited all his friends and there was slaughtering of cows. You know, I think it was African slaughtering. You people, I don't know how you kill your animals. Some of you have never killed. Some of you don't know how they die. You find them in the store and you say, hallelujah. You pick it. For us, we go for it. You, if it's chicken, you go for it. You tell your son who is 12 or 20, you say, chase that chicken. So they go to the neighborhood across the road, you know, until he grabs it, brings it home. Pop, 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 pop. And then you get it. Put it down in the air. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and so this guy who had lost, you know, the one child, when the child came back, they slaughtered some cows. And I believe it was African style. It was not American style. And there was party because I had lost my son and my son who had gone is now back. All the three parables teach us many things. But one thing I want to speak about today is the spirit of not tolerating loss. You should never tolerate anything that takes away from you. Because that's the work of the enemy. Never tolerate anything which takes your joy. Never tolerate anything which takes your money. Never tolerate anything that takes people away from you. Never, because that's not of God. 
Tell your neighbor, never tolerate. Am I saying it the American way? Tolerate. That's what, that was British way. They colonized us. We will colonize them someday, maybe. <laughs> but the key thing is, never allow loss. When something happens and it's taking away from your life, don't say it's okay. No, it's not okay. It's not okay. You just go and say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, this is going and it's not okay. I fight for it back in Jesus' name. And you come against the spirit taking away. Whatever is taking away my joy, I come against you in Jesus' name. Hey, tell your neighbor, never tolerate. Hey, you're about to take my accent. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so it's not okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. So I'm going to share with you briefly a few things, a few points, could be three or four, which are going to help you as you go about your work. I want to speak, I want to give you a few points, how to have victory at work. I told you work is spiritual. And so I'm going to speak to you about how to make, to have victory at your workplace. Number one, I want to share with you the principle of dedication. Work is spiritual, whatever it is. You could be a plumber, you could be a banker, you could be a seller of tomato, whatever it is. Work is very spiritual. And in Africa, we have discovered that work is very spiritual. If you doubt that, come to Africa. <laughs> so, work is spiritual. That's why God has interest in your work. Okay? And I'll prove to you that in, in a little while. But let me give you these principles, then I'll come back and prove that to you. Work is spiritual. And because it's spiritual, the first principle for you to enjoy your work and have victory at work is a principle of dedication. The Bible teaches us that whatever is ours, we should dedicate it to God. Samuel as a baby was dedicated to God. Principle of dedication. Principle of dedication. You dedicate your things. You dedicate your money. You dedicate your property. You dedicate your children. And dedication is simple. It's a spiritual principle. Whichever spirit you give your property, the spirit takes it. If you told the devil, here is my child, the devil will take the child. Yes, and oversee and take good care. But you know how he takes good care? He's, he comes to steal, kill, in destroy. So he will do that because he knows how to. So when you give something to God, you give your child, God will take care because it's a spiritual principle. And God takes well, very good care. That's why I'm happy here and you're happy there because God is taking good care of you. So it's a spiritual principle. Amen. So we dedicate our work. When you enter your office, probably it's a new job or a new business you're setting up, it's not bad for you to go as the boss, as the owner, to say, Lord, thank you for this. I dedicate this to you. Be the God of this place. Rule and reign in this place. You know, you demarcate the zone and you hand it to him. You say, this is yours. And Satan, this is not yours. Principle of dedication. In the Bible, churches are dedicated. When a church is starting... People come around and they say, Lord, we dedicate this space that you may always be here. That the children, people who come here may be blessed. That your presence may be here. That's exactly what you do in your office. In your workplace. In your home. Lord, this is yours. Take over here. Satan, you're not welcome. No invitation. In case you come here, you're trespassing. And I'll charge you. Criminal trespass. Courts of law, Satan. And sickness, this is not your zone. Hey, you tell sickness here, no, try elsewhere, no invitation. Try next door, probably. You tell sorrow, you tell, you know, whatever it is. You tell, you know, no. Back home, we have women who 
you know, pray those prayers when their husband are around and say, Father, this is yours and this is our place for marriage. No other woman will come here to disturb my husband in Jesus' name. <laughs> they demarcate their property. <laughs> the Bible says, wherever your foot shall step, I have given it to you. Meaning, you step there and you possess spiritually and physically. You not only possess physically, you possess spiritually. Ah, Hallelujah. So principle of dedication. And I don't have time. I'm just going through. I know you people are Bible scholars, so you will get the rest. Prince, that's why we give first fruits. Because you're saying, Lord, I'm studying this. And I want you to be part of it from beginning to the end. I want you to be my alpha and my omega. And so I'm giving you a first fruit. That's why we tithe. When you tithe, what are you saying? Lord, we are in this together. We are in this work, this business, this venture together. And so I give you a tithe that you may rebuke the devourer. The Bible says when you tithe, the Lord rebukes the devourer. And so you're telling the Lord, I know this is a spiritual work. It's a spiritual battle. And I, you are on my side. You are you who fights my battles. It's you who gives me wisdom when I need it. It's you who protects when I need protection. And I give you my tithe. That you may do the spiritual work which I can't do. Hallelujah. Amen. Tell your neighbor, do you know how to tithe? Back home, we know people who know a lot of mathematics, who know how to compute VAT, which is 17%. They know how to compute import duty, which is, you know, 2.5% of something. They know how to compute very difficult things. But when it comes to a tenth, they get confused. They say, what's that? What's that? You know, they can't compute the time. <laughs> I know you're not like them. You're smarter. Do you know that the scripture says there are people who earn money, put it in their pockets, and the pockets have holes? That's a spiritual dynamic, and we see it back at home. There are people whom I know who earn lots of money, but they have no explanation about how they, it goes. And there are people who earn lot, little money, and somehow you can see their progress. And you can, oh, what happened? Oh, even, oh. But there's someone with the money, and each time they come, they're instead borrowing. And you're saying, what happened? And can I explain? Spiritual. Money is spiritual. Work is spiritual. <laughs> Let's go to the next. I might not end. I might not end. So I've talked about that side. But I also want us to talk about the other spiritual aspect about your work. And I want to go mathematics a bit. I'm not a mathematician. I don't like math. But I want to go through something which I hope will bring an eye opener to you. For those, I believe that the average work hours is eight. And I'm saying average. People work eight hours. Average a day. And average people work five days. Okay? So average someone works 40 hours. Is that average here? That's average back home. Of course we have extremes. Those who work a lot more. And we have those who work a lot less. But I'm saying average. And so if you work 40 hours a week. Wow. That's eight hours a day. If you work eight hours a day. And the day has 24 hours. It means you have 24 hours at work and we are, you have, what is the other? You have 16 hours for other things, 16 hours to sleep, 16 hours to eat, 16 hours to travel, watch a movie, you know, watch something, do other things. So since you have eight hours for work, clearly marked for work, and you have 16 hours for this long list of other things. Okay. Now, every week, most Christians, and I'm saying average, have two hours for church on Sunday. And they have maybe one hour for a week service or a home group. So average, and I'm saying average, there are those who have more and there are those who have a lot less. But average, Christians have three hours a week for God things, for church. Okay? Okay? 
Okay. <laughs> if you don't say okay, I would say it many more times because I think I will think my accent is not communicating. So when I say okay and you when you shake your head, it tells me to go faster. When you don't, I will go slow and change words and change phrases so you can get it. So just shake your head or say okay and everything will be faster. Good, thank you. So three hours a week is for God things. Eight hours every day when you are sober, just woken up, vibrant, sober, alert. Where are you? Work. Then the rest of the work after you have, you know, lost energy, lost gas, lost everything. That's when you come home, you're tired, you get home, probably watch a few TV movies, you know, drink some coffee, have a mac cheese and some burrito somewhere. And you're really tired and your wife is tired and you're tired and your kids are tired because everybody has been somewhere for eight hours and you really just want to go to your bed and pass out. Because so most of the time you are to work at work, strong, vibrant, a lot. Yeah. At home you're tired. And most of the other time at home you are horizontal. Okay. Now, I'm going to the gist of it. If you are to be a Christian, where will you be a Christian at? Will that be a home? Will that, will that be a church? Will it, <laughs> where will it be? Work! So if you're to be a Christian, your victory as a Christian and your lifestyle and life as a Christian Active will be at work because that's where you are. At home, you're not there. You arrive when you, <laughs> when you just want to drink something, shower and at church, you're not here. Pastor, they are not here. <laughs> Do you know what happens at work? I mean, at home, back some church, we have those who come very early, the committed ones. God bless them. Those ones make church happen. Woo. They part of the choir ushers and other things. You know, they come in early. They make sure everything's okay. Those ones, oh, God bless them so much for their commitment and love. And But then we have those who take many cups of porridge. One cup for walking to church. One cup for the sermon. One cup for praise and worship. One cup for the offering. So they take too many cups of porridge. And by the time they get to church, they are one, number one, late. And number two, they are so heavy up he <laughs> down here. They just sit and... Because the, the body is processing. So even when we have them at church, they are coming late. And when they arrive, they are not very active anyway. Because the body is processing other things. So if you are going to be attacked by the devil, where will the devil find you? At church? You're not there. At home? You're dreaming at home. You're not active. It's at work. And so the battles we take to church and the battles we take home, they most times do not start at home and they don't start at church. They start at work. It's from work that you come and you're all messed up and you mess up your kids and your children and you know everything you because you are messed up there. And your wife is thinking, Oh, probably I did something wrong. No, something wrong happened at work. It could have been physical, it could have been spiritual, it could whatever it was, emotional, and you carried it and you dumped it at home. Damn. And now it has become a home problem. Probably see your wife. They confused her in the salon where she was, you know. They go there and they spend a lot of time, probably manicure, pedicure. In the process, things happen. You bring them and throw them in your husband's face. Damn. And it becomes a home challenge because most of the challenges we have come from work. That's where the devil really attacks. The work is the front line, the battle line. Yes, at work. That simple laptop you have in that simple room you sit with those people who look very corporate, you know, polished, speaking nice English, doing so much math and so much whatever it is. You know, it's the truth. <laughs> That's the trouble zone. 
And unless you know that and you take your work as spiritual and you handle everything happening at work as spiritual, hmm, you might have a few problems. So tell your neighbor work is spiritual. I would tell you testimonies and more testimonies, but I don't have time. But I want you to know that work is spiritual. Most of the things you have at work and your work area is so intoxicated with, you know, maybe backstabbing or maybe, you know, whatever it is. If you took a moment just to get away and just talk to the Lord about that, you will discover that it's more spiritual than physical. That boss of yours who's always picking on you and letting others go free, that, you know, that situation, you know, some of those are highly spiritual. The devil is coming after you and you just need to be a little bit more spiritual to silence the enemy in Jesus' name. For the Bible says in Corinthians, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. And when we come to church, we employ those weapons. When we are here, we get the weapons and we tell, where is the enemy? And, you know, we are ready to fire at him. When we get to the place of work, we leave the weapons here. You arrive there as others. You arrive as someone who does not know spiritual warfare, as someone who is so ignorant of spiritual. You just arrive arrive, and say, I'm here to get a paycheck. No, you're here to do spiritual work. Hallelujah. And let me tell you to the, let me take you to the last one. If you are ever to serve God, where will you serve him? At home? In church? Say it, please. Say it again. Now, those of you who didn't say it, please say it. Amen. If you are to ever serve God, you're never going to serve God here because you're not here. Here is our center where we come on Sunday. Probably we come some other days of the week and we are refilled. And Pastor Jim comes and lays hands and the weights go off us. And we get more and we drink more. We eat more. And we go when we have a few pounds in the spirit. We arrive at work ready. Ready to minister. Ready to do spiritual warfare. Ready to walk in the spirit. Ready. Hallelujah. Oh, you are the minister. God has deployed at your work. When God looks at you know, Ridge Crest, he knows I have somebody in the other hub. I, I don't even know the places. You know, but when God looks around, he knows here I have somebody, there I have somebody, there I had somebody. And the Lord knows you're the salt and the light where you work. And the Lord knows you are the river which brings good news to the city where you work. The Lord knows I have somebody if I need healing, somebody whose hands I can use. To bring healing. Whose feet I can use. To be the feet of Jesus. Whose mouth I can use. To seize on the place where they work from. The Lord knows you're there. And is ready to work with you. He's ready to work with you. Back home I encourage Christians to serve in their marketplace. And we have served and served. And let me tell you. I'm not saying get the Bible and stand and say. This morning. At the workplace, you know. This morning, I want to read for you Matthew chapter 5. No. You are the Matthew chapter 5. People look at you and they read you. Oh, hallelujah. And I'm not saying go and begin praying. Before we start work today, I have a prayer. No. Say the prayer because they don't believe. Say the prayer as you're looking at your laptop and say, Father, I invite you in this workplace today. May peace prevail. May joy prevail. You know, you, it is you, the prophet, speak in the environment. You don't need their consent. They don't believe what you believe. But God believes what you believe and he hears you. He's your partner. And so you work with him at your workplace. And when there's somebody with a long face, probably they're battling something. You go to them and say, you know what? I don't know what you're going through, but may the Lord be with you. And then they will say, oh, there's somebody here who cares. And when there's somebody sick and they have not come to work, swing by after work and say, you know what? You didn't come to work and I just came to love you. And the other church where I go to, they sent me to come and just minister love to you. 
Which church? Oh, I come, I, ECC, I, the pastor sent me to just come and love on you, love on you, you know? <laughs> if you can't preach the gospel, at least just say words like that, you know? Say words which, you know, say pastor, say the church, the son, the church loves you, you know? Say something spiritual. <laughs> say something. Say something. Back home, we do that. There are some neighbors who are Muslim, and you just go and you know you can't preach to them. So you go and say, church sent me to love you. Just love you as you go through this situation. And in case you need prayer, I can pray. Oh, I can invite other people to come. We can love you, love you. Church, church, church. You say something to point them to another direction. Yeah. And if you think they can allow prayer, pray in Jesus' name. Lord, then you go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We need to win rich Christ for the Lord. I mean, what is it? Else no. <laughs> I, have been, I have been in rich Christ for two weeks, so it's still in me. <laughs> we need to win else no for the Lord. And you can bring someone who Pastor Jim will never meet. The people you work with, work with, work with, work with. Your neighbors, Pastor Jim will never meet them. But you meet them. They should look at you and see Jesus. They should see the love you have for them and be attracted to you. Love is the biggest language. It breaks all barriers, color barriers, racial barriers. If people feel and sense love in you for them, genuine love, they will follow you wherever you go. They will follow you. That's why we fall in love and marry. When you look at her and she seems like she loves you genuinely, you melt you. Get confused. In the, most people say they fall in. I don't know where they fall, but they fall in love. Wherever it is, I don't know where it is. But So pe- people respond to love everywhere. If they sense there is a pure love of Christ in you, they will follow you. They will ask you questions. They will come to you. Praise the Lord. And so you are the minister at your workplace. You are the one to encourage. You are the one to speak. You are the one to bless. Because it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And I want to end with that. It's all about Jesus. The Bible gives us Jesus in many pictures. It says Jesus is the bread of life. So that bakers can understand him. Jesus is the way. So that the people who walk on the way may understand him. Jesus is the truth so that politicians can understand him. Jesus is the word so that movie actors and poets can understand him. Jesus is the living water so that plumbers can understand him. Jesus is the resurrection so that funeral directors too can understand him. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega so that scientists can understand him. Jesus is the Good Shepherd so that farmers can understand him. Now I could go on and on and on. Jesus is many things so that all people can understand him. You can communicate Jesus in many ways even without bringing out the Bible because already you are the Bible. You can communicate Jesus to anyone, whoever they are, because Jesus is all things to all people so that all people can understand him. In my experience, you can start a conversation on baseball and end up in Jesus. You can start a conversation on hair and twist it to say something about Jesus. You can start anywhere. And love on people and in the process twist the conversation somehow to talk about either church or the choir church or, you know, you can say something that helps people to know that you have somebody you love, Jesus, and somebody who can come and help them. You can preach the gospel in many simple ways which are so normal to anybody because Jesus is everything to everyone so that everyone can understand him. 
And back home, that's what I do. If I meet a politician, we start with politics. And I'm praying, Lord, give me a way that I may chip in something about you. Lord, give me a way. And I've seen some who get saved instantly. And I've seen some who gradually take a long time. But eventually get to appreciate your God. They might not even get saved. But they appreciate that your God is a good God. Because as you discuss the complexities of life. And you know the fun parts of life. You find a way to bring Jesus. Because Jesus is everything to everyone. So that everyone can be able to understand him. This morning, I just want to pray for you that as you work, the Lord will be with you. That you will see increase in your work. And any power, any force that is antagonizing you at the workplace, that the Lord may repel it, dispel it, rebuke it, that it may be out of your way. I also want to pray for you this morning that the anointing to move as the light, as the salt, as the minister, as the transforming agent for Christ may fall upon you. That wherever you go, people may be blessed to have you. They may be happy to have you. That wherever you go, you may bring a difference. You may bring a change. You may be the change agent people need. And so those are my two prayers. I will invite you to stand. And just... Surrender to the Lord for the next two minutes. And let's believe God that your workplace will change and that even your life will change. Father, I want to thank you for my brethren. Thank you for RIM and the spirit with which we walk in RIM. The spirit for nations, concern for nations, concerns to see transformation in the regions where we are and in the, na- and in the other neighborhoods. We want to thank you, Father, for this morning, for the word that has gone forth. I pray that you may water it, O Lord, that that word may bear fruit in your lives of your children, that it may bring forth fruit, much fruit, 70-fold, 100-fold, in the name of Jesus. And Father, for areas where I've even lacked communication, not be able to communicate adequately, Spirit of the living God, may you communicate to your children. Speak to them with clarity. Help them to realize the dynamic in their workplace and how you can use them to bring a difference, to bring a change in the name of Jesus. Father, there are your children here who labor, but even as they go about their business, about their work, Lord, the enemy has antagonized them. Satan has given them headache. And we agree in the spirit of unity this morning. We rebuke every demonic presence. We rebuke every Every enemy of your children, every spirit that has, that has come into their workplace and brought sorrow and brought hardship, we come against you right now in the name of Jesus and we rebuke you, Satan. Leave the workplaces of your children of God. We rebuke you. We render you powerless in the name of Jesus. Father, every presence that is not of you, which has antagonized your children, made them cry, brought stress and sorrow. We come against it right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we utterly rebuke them. And this morning, Father, we believe for a blessing for your children that as they work, your blessing will be present. Your blessing will hover over their work, over their workplaces, that peace will prevail, that joy will prevail, that increase and multiplication will prevail, that your children will eat the good of the land, O God, in the name of Jesus. Father, when the righteous prosper, righteousness increases. When the wicked prosper, wickedness is established. And Father, we ask that for the work of the ministry, for purposes of working and ministering and missions, may you bless these, your children. In the name of Jesus. And Father, we also dedicate, I dedicate my friends before you. That you may use them, Lord, to bring many into your house. In the name of Jesus. May you anoint their lips, oh Father. That even as they communicate, people will feel your presence. People will feel the warmth that comes out of them. That your word will go forth in many ways. 
and will draw many to you, Lord. I pray for your children and even as their hands touch other bodies, touch other things, healing virtue will flow and bring a blessing and bring ministry and bring change in the lives of many who will come across them. I ask you, Father, that whoever is here, Lord, and they feel like they are shy to represent you, they feel like they don't have the boldness, they don't have what it takes. May you, Lord, anoint them. May you strengthen them. May you equip them, Lord, that together we may stand for you and be a blessing. Father, I want to thank you for even the coming week as your children go about their business, as they work, May your presence be present. May your presence be real. May they feel you. May they feel you, Lord. May they hear you. May they work with you. And Father, may this week be a week of victory. Physically and spiritually. We thank you. We bless you. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen.